Hawa, Shalawam, Shabbata. This is part seven of the Hebrew Aboriginal Copper Colored Tribes of America. Yeah, so we're just gonna continue to show a little bit more correlation. We're gonna focus on certain things, of course, uh, in this part. I hope you guys like it. Cause we just talking Jehowashi, Jehowashi, Jehowashi. All right. The history, the history that has been erased in our nation, and in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into them? History of the American Indian by James Adair. Now, let us now turn to the copper-colored American Hebrews. Again. <laughs> Now, I didn't know this was here, all right, but you know, this is what's this video called Hebrew Aboriginal Copper Colored Tribes of America. So, in the book History of the American Indian by James Adair, he says, Let us now turn to the Copper Color American Hebrews. While their sanctified new fruits are dressing, a religious attendant is ordered to call six of their old beloved women to come to the temple and dance the beloved dance with joyful hearts according to the old beloved speech they cheerfully obey and enter the supposed holy ground in solemn procession each carrying in her hand a bundle of small branches of various green trees and they join the same number of old magi or priests who carry a cane in one hand adorned with white feathers having likewise green bows in their other hand which they pulled from their holy arbor and carefully placed there, encircling it with several rounds. Those beloved men have their heads dressed with white plumes, but the women are decked in their finest and anointed with beer's grease, having small tortoise shells with white pebbles fastened to a piece of white dressed deerskin, which is tied to each of their legs. The eldest of the priests leads the sacred dance, ahead of the innermost row which of course is next to the holy fire he begins to dance around the supposed holy fire by invoking Jah after their usual manner on a bass key and with a short accent then he sings Jojo which is repeated by the rest of the religious procession and he continues his sacred invocations and praises repeating the divine word or notes till they return to the same point of the circular course where they begin then he he in like manner and wa wa he wa he wa ha wa ha wa right he he wa wa ha ha wa wa ha wa ha wa while dancing they never fail to repeat those notes and frequently the holy train stripe up ha le lu ha le lu then ha le lu ha le lu ya and Alleluia, Alleluia, irradiation to the divine essence, and they sound more like Alleluia, Alleluia, A L E L O Y A. With great earnestness and fervor, till they encircle the altar, while each strikes the ground with right and left feet alternatively, very quick but well timed. Then the awful drums join the sacred core which incite the old female singers to chant forth their pious notes and great grateful praises before the divine essence and to redouble their former quick joyful steps in imitation of the leader of the sacred dance and the religious man ahead of them what with the manly strong notes of the one and the shrill voices of the other in concert with the beach shells and the two found in drum like earthen vessels which the voices of the musicians who beat them the reputed holy ground echoes with the praises of Yohewa. Their singing and dancing in three circles around their sacred fire appears to have a reference to a like religious custom of the Hebrews. And may we not re reasonably suppose that they formerly understood the Psalms or divine hymns, at least those that begin with Allelu Ja. Otherwise, how come all the inhabitants of the extensive regions of North and South America to have and retain those very expressive Hebrew words? All right. You hear what James Adair is telling you, right? 
how come it's so extensive throughout the North and South America? All mo- much of the in- tribes, he's saying, say, Hallelujah, 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 right? Or how repeat them so distinctly and apply them after the manner of the Hebrews in their religious acclamation. So it's not only that they're just randomly saying it, they're using it significantly in their religious acclamations, just like the Hebrews did, all right? We still use these words today. I mean, they pass it over to um, Christianity. You know, we say Alleluia in Spanish, but, you know, in English, you know, but it has a foundation, right? It has a source and it has a, a, a meaning behind it. The light cannot be found in other countries. In like manner, they sing on other religious occasions and at their feast of love, Aleyo, Aleyo, which is the divine name by his attribute of omnipotence and alluding to and i believe that's hawa they sing likewise hewa hewa <laughs> like i just said right they sing like likewise hewa hawa all right so you see what i'm showing you right which is and it shows there the you know the syrian jewish hebrew the immortal soul drawn from the divine essential name as deriving its rational faculties from yohewa those words that they've sing in their religious dances, they never repeat at any other time, which seems to have greatly occasioned the, lo- the loss of the meaning of their divine hymn. For I believe they are now so corrupt as not to understand either the spiritual or literal meaning of what they sing any further than by illusion. All right, we're in the book uh, called View of the Hebrews, exhibiting the destruction of Jerusalem, the certain restoration of Judah and Israel, the present state of Judah and Israel and an address of the prophet Isaiah relative to their restoration by Ethan Smith. All right. And we're going to read from chapter three, the present state of Judah and Israel. All right? The present state in his time, right? What he's saying is the present state of Judah and Israel. All right. And we read in page 76, it says, Let several suppositions now be made. Suppose an extensive continent had lately been discovered, all right? Let's suppose, right? Let's, let's, let's go with Ethan Smith and let's suppose, right? Quote, quote, Away northeast from Medea, and at the distance of a year and a half journey. So he's describing the journey of, uh, and described in Esdras, right? Of the Ten Lost Tribes how it took them uh, a year and a half to get to As- Arsaref, Arsaref, Arizona, Arsaref, hmm, sounds similar. A, pr- a, a place probably destitute of inhabitants since the flood till the time of the casting out of Israel. Suppose a people to have been lately discovered, hmm, a people that has been lately discovered, hmm, in that sequestered region, appearing as we should rationally expect the nation of Israel to appear at this period. So there's, he's saying there's a people, let's suppose there's a people being discovered at the same time that nation of Israel is supposed to appear. Had the account given by the writer in Esdras been a fact? Suppose them to be found in tribes with heads of tribes. I'm talking about chiefs, cacique, or as you say in Hebrew, katsin, katsin, katsike, katsin, katsi, same word. But destitute of letters and in a savage state. Suppose among their different tribes, the following traditionary fragments are by credible witnesses picked up. Some particulars among one region of them and some among another. While all appear evidently to be of the same family. Suppose them to have escaped the polytheism of the pagan world and to acknowledge one and only one God, the Great Spirit, who created all things, seen and unseen. Suppose, all right, let's keep supposing. The name retained by many of them for this Great Spirit to be Ale, the old Hebrew name of God, and Jehovah. Jehovah. Hawa. Whereas the Hebrew name for Lord was Jehovah. Dodge the hijack. Jahawah. 
Hawa. Also, they call the great first cause Jah, the Hebrew name being Jah. No J is in Hebrew. Dash the hijack. Suppose you find most of them professing great reverence for this great Jahawa, calling him the great beneficent supreme Holy Spirit and the only object of worship, the only, only one savior, right? Isaiah 43, the only object of worship, Jahawa. Wow. Suppose the most intelligent of them to be elated with the idea that this God has ever been the head of their community, that their fathers were once in covenant with him and the rest of the world were the accursed people as out of a covenant with God. Suppose you find them on certain occasions singing and religious dance. Hallelujah. 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 Or praise to Yah. Also singing Yahweh. Yahweh. Shilu. Yahweh. And making use of many names and phrases evidently Hebrew. Let's keep supposing. Who is he talking about? You find them counting their time as did ancient Israel and in a manner different from all other nations. They keep a variety of religious feasts which must resemble those kept in ancient Israel. You find an evening feast among them in which a bone of the animal must not be broken. If the provision be more than one family can eat, a neighbor must be called in to help eat it and if any of it be still left, it must be burned before the next rising sun. You find them eating bitter vegetables to cleanse themselves from sin. You find them never eat the hollow of the thigh of any animal. They inform that their fathers practice circus circumcision. Some of them have been in the habit of keeping a jubilee. They have their places answering to the cities of refuge in ancient Israel and these no blood is ever shed by any avenger you find them with their temples such as they be their holy of holies in their temple into which it is death for a common person to enter they have their high priest cons who officiate in their temples and make their yearly atonement there in a singular pontifical dress which they fancy to be in the likeness of one worn by their predecessors in ancient times with their breastplate and various holy ornaments the high priest when addressing to his people what they call the old divine speech calls them the beloved and holy people beloved beloved land the Americans beloved and urges them to imitate their virtuous ancestors and tells them of their beloved land their beloved land to marry to marry to marry Ka, their beloved land flowing with milk and honey terrestrial paradise the land of golden pearls thank you Khan drop for the drop beloved land to marry they tell you that Yohewa Jahawa Hawa once chose their nation from all the rest of mankind to be his peculiar people that a book which God gave was once theirs and then things went well with them but other people got it from them and then they fell under the displeasure of the great spirit they fell Deuteronomy 28 but that they shall at some time regain it they inform you some of their fathers once had the spirit to foretell future events and to work miracles. Suppose they have their imitation of the Ark of the Covenant. Where are deposited their most sacred things into which it is death for any common people to look. All their males must appear at the temple at three noted feasts in a year. They inform you of the ancient flood, the ancient flood, of the preservation of one family in a vessel, of this man in the ark sending out first a great bird and then a little one 
to see if the waters were gone, that the great one returned no more, but the little one returned with a branch. They tell you of the confusion of languages. Once when people were building a great high place and of the longevity of the ancients, that they lived till their feet were worn out with walking and their throats with eating. All right, talking about antediluvians. You find them with their traditional history that their ancient fathers once lived where people were dreadfully wicked and that nine tenths of their fathers took counsel and left that wicked place being led by the great spirit into this country out of Egypt bondage that they came through a region where it was always winter snow and frozen that they came to a great water in their way hither was thus obstructed so God dried up that water. Probably it froze between the islands and Barren Strait. He's saying probably. Let's dodge the hijack. You're fine. You find them keeping an annual feast at the time their ears of corn become fit for use. And none of the corn is eaten till a part of it is brought to this feast. And certain religious ceremonies performed. You find them keeping an annual feast in which 12 men must cut 12 sapling poles to make booth. Here, on an altar made of 12 stones on which no tool may pass, they must sacrifice. You find them with the custom of washing and anointing their dead. And when in deep affliction, laying their hand on their mouth and their mouth in the dust. Suppose you should find things like these among such a people without books or letters, but holy in a savage state in a region of the world lately discovered away in the direction stated by the aforenoted writer in the apocrypha hidden or secret books forbidden for the normal people remember the etymology and having been ever secluded from the knowledge of the civilized world would you hesitate to say you had found the ten tribes of israel all right, so Ethan Smith, he had a supposing, right? He had his imagining. So he read out all those traits, all those things he found that are in common, right? With what we would know as, you know, the tribes of Israel or Hebrews, right? Doing, practicing, living, you know, living in that way. All right, so again, would you hesitate after hearing all that to say you had found the 10 tribes of Israel? I'm asking you right now, hearing right now. And that God sent them to that secret sequestered region of the earth to keep them there a distinct distinct people during an outcast state of at least 2,500 years would you not say we have just such kind of evidence as must at, at last bring that people to light among the nations huh he's asking you and would you not say here is much more evidence of this kind of their being the people of Israel than could rationally have been expected after the lapse of 2,500 years in a savage state, dodged the hijack, high civilization. Methinks I hear every person whisper his full assent that upon the suppositions made, we have found the most essential pile of the prophet Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. Those things are more than mere supposition. It's not supposition, people. It is believed they are capable of being ascertained as facts with substantial evidence. If we haven't shown you enough, there's still much more evidence to show. Good authorities from men who have been eye and ear witnesses, people who lived among them, assure us that these things are facts, but you inquire where or who are the people thus described. They are the aborigines of our own continent. We're talking about he's in America. All right. Who are you talking about, man? Just tell us. They are the aborigines of our own continent. The aboriginal copper colored tribes of America, right? That's the definition for the word American. Webster's Dictionary, 1828. Aboriginal, aborigines. All right, that's who he's talking about. So how are they migrants if they're aborigines? 
how do they come through the Bering Strait? And then you're calling them Aborigines. You overstand? Dash the hijack. But he knows what's up. All right? Their place, their language, their traditions amount to all that has been hinted. These evidences are not all found among any one tribe of Indians, nor may all the Indians in any tribe where various of these evidences are found be able to exhibit them. It is enough if what they call their beloved aged men in one tribe have clearly exhibited some of them and others exhibited others of them. And if among their various tribes, the whole have been by various of their beloved or wise men exhibited, this, it is stated, has been the fact Men have been gradually perceiving this evidence for more than a half a century. And new light has been from time to time shed on the subject as will appear. Well, this here's my, my new trunk buster. This is my daughter, Catherine. Shalom Aleikum, Jackson Two Bears. Mr. Baloo, what's the use of saying Shalom Aleikum to me? I'm a full Sioux Indian. I'm not one of the chosen people. All right, go ahead being stubborn if you want well, it. I ain't stubborn. Oh, not much you ain't. You know, according to an ex-congressman of these United States, I heard give a lecture at the Chautauqua this winter. Injuns is the lost tribe of Israel, but he won't admit it. Just ain't true. He was an ex-congressman of these United States, I tell you. Oh, Papa, maybe he was mistaken. Uh, no, he was not. Jackson just got a mean, stubborn streak in him is all. I brought Mr. Bernstein, the telegraph operator, out here from town last month. And he stood right where you're standing now, and he talked Hebrew at Jackson for ten minutes by my watch, and Jackson pretended he didn't understand a word. Now, I call that stubborn. Well, I didn't understand a word. You see what I mean? Now, you get that trunk down out of there. I'll get the satchel. They've been putting it in your face the whole time, all right? So now we're in this book. It's called Anacalypsis. We've gone in, uh, in this book before. It says, uh, an attempt to draw aside the veil or the static ISIS, an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions by the late Ger Godfrey Higgins, Esquire. And this is written in 1836. The close connection between the Americans and the old world was long ago seen, notwithstanding all the exertions of the Spaniards to keep mankind in the dark and fruitless endeavors were made by Grotius and others to find a cause for it. All right, so there's a close connection between the Americans and the old world. I've been telling you, we've been telling you. Thank you, Hawa, for all the scholars, for all the people you've put in my path that have taught me, put me in the right perspective, had me thinking clearly and, and you know, seeing clearly right that you know this is the true old world so of course there is a connection between the americans and the old world the people of north america were taught by penn to have an unaccountable likeness to the jews and the masa jati were thought to be found in massachusetts so this last sentence it says the people of north america were taught by penn they're talking about william penn the founder of and the uh, person they named Pennsylvania after, right? In volume six, page 79, the Mexican courts are shown to have had exactly the same number of judges as those of the Jews or Hebrews. Again, the Mexican courts are shown to have had exactly the same number of judges as those of the Hebrews, that their sacred numbers were exactly the same and that both nations kept fast for exactly the same number of days. Lord Kingsborough says the common law of every state in Europe has been confessedly modeled after the Mosaic law. This is very important observation and I think its truth will not be disputed but I think there is no other way of accounting for it than to go to my pri pri primeval, the primeval nation. The common law in most states is evidently older than Christianity. We are told that St. Augustine brought Christianity into this island in the year 596. But was there no Christianity in the time of Constantine or before? Lord Kingsborough says, The affinity between the Mexican and the Hebrew laws is greater 
than between the latter and those of any nation with with which we are acquainted okay so i think he's saying that it's more affiliated and has more similarity uh the mexican right to hebrew than to christian to the latter they circumcised with a stoned knife the use of which was ex expressively ordered it is remarkable that the circumcision of the Jews should have been performed with a knife made of stone, which is emphatically noticed in the Bible. All right. The, Jew, the Hebrews used a stone knife. The Mexicans used a stone knife for some precision. Lord Kingsborough has gone to an enormous length and proven that the Mexican rites, ceremonies, etc. were almost precisely the same as those of the Jews and that they must consequently have been brought by the Jews to Mexico. But one most important observation offers itself on this. We possess what we believe to be the knowledge of all the Jewish rites, history, etc. in Syria. But this is not the way all these things are known by the Americans. All the things said to have taken place in Western Syria, both with Jews and Christians are said to have been acted in America. Again, all the things said to have taken place in Western Syria, both with Jews or Hebrews and Christians, are said to have been acted in America. All right, it happened here in America as well. Which one is the duplicate? And the case in a great measure is the same in India and China. The third India, this is India. All right. There is the same standing still of the sun, the same populi fugia, the same deluge and persons saved in a ship, the same immaculate conception, the same crucifixion and resurrection. But they were all in the American country, not in Syria. All right. Again, all the things we just uh, went over the Immaculate Conception, the Crucifixion, the Deluge, right? All the same stories that we hear in the Old Testament, the so-called Bible, happened in the American country, not in Syria. Again, in the book, Discourse on Evidences of the American Indians Being Descendants of the Lost Tribes of Israel, continues says here, Sword says of the Indians of Suriname, this is in South America, on the authority of Nazi, or Nazi, Nazi, a learned Jew, residing there that the dialects of those indians common in Gi Gi Giana, Ginana, Giana, is soft agreeable and regular and their substantives are hebrew their substantives are hebrew all right a learned jew right he recognized the people in Guyana, suriname right they were their words have some substantives that are hebrew their language in the roots, idioms, and particular construction has the genius of the Hebrew language. Hebrew, as the orations have the bold, laconic, and figurative style of the Hebrew prophets. All right? Sword said that. All right? From the authority of a Nazi, a learned Jew. All right? The Reverend Mr. Chapman says of the Osages, it is their universal practice to salute the dawn of every morning with their devotion a custom always prevailing among pious Jews Malvenda and Acosta both affirmed that the natives had a tradition of jubilee according to the jubilee of Israel Dr. Be Betty in speaking of the festival of the first fruits by the Indians west of the Ohio says at this ceremony 12 of their old men divided there into 12 parts and these men hold up the venison and fruits with their faces to the east and acknowledge in the bounty of God to them. A singular cl and close imitation of the ceremonies and sacrifices of the temple. The doctor further says they have another feast which looks like the Passover. Again, the Passover. Sir Alexander Mackenzie in his tour to the northwest coast says that the Chepewyan, the Chepewyan Indians have a tradition among them that they originally came from another country 
inhabited by very wicked people, and had traversed the great lake, which was in one place narrow and shallow and full of islands, where they had suffered great misery. And at further tradition has it that nine parts of their nation out of ten passed over the river. The Mexican affirmed that seven tribes or houses passed from the east to the wilderness. Like many others of the era, he had a theory regarding the identity of the people who built these great monuments. A common opinion in Weirich's time was that the mounds were constructed by the lost tribes of Israel or other Hebrew groups. The Indians who lived near or around the mound groups had no history regarding their purpose nor knowledge of the mound's use. Weirich and the others had good reason to believe that the mounds had been constructed by Hebrews. The Quaker William Penn remarked that when he was among the Indians, he could easily imagine himself in the Jewish quarter of London. So great were the resemblances of features and gestures between the Indians and the Jews. Caleb Atwater, one of the early figures in American archaeology, cites the Bible, 2 Kings, that the Israelites built them in high places, mounds, in all of their cities. Atwater further states that the Israelites conducted great national affairs on these mounds. Here, they crowned kings, concluded peace, and declared war. They assembled to worship and they buried their illustrious dead. But perhaps the most interesting observation that Atwater made was the following. He wrote, the Hebrews would gather at Gilgal. The name Gilgal signifies heap. Here was a pile of stones brought up from the river Jordan and piled up when they encamped for the first night on their journey to the promised land. Let the reader examine similar piles of stone on the waters of the Licking near Newark, Ohio. Who were the mound builders? Everybody had an opinion. And David's opinion agreed with a lot of other people, although it was ridiculed, that is that they were at least descendants of the uh, lost tribes of Israel. Because after all, the Indians were savages and they could not have built geometric works such as these. So when David discovered stones with Hebrew on them, then the trouble began. To do a chronology on the events relative to the discovery of the Holy Stones of Newark, you need to start with the fact that David Weirich was an amateur archaeologist. And he had apparently retired somewhere in 1858, 1859. And this puts us into June of 1860, when he and his son were digging in the McCrory's Woods, which is near the Octagon Mound in Newark, Ohio. It was there that they found buried in a pit there, what it's come to be called, because a newspaper reporter said it was that, a holy stone. It had characters on it. It was identified and looked at by a number of people in Newark, including the mayor of the town, who was really quite a scientist. Uh, Charles Whittlesey, the founder of the Western Reserve Historical Society and Ohio's foremost archaeologist at the time, and the local Episcopal clergyman, who really rather quickly translated it. It caused all kinds of excitement. In fact, the story is they formed a committee and everybody went out and started digging hunting for some more of them and probably destroyed some more archaeological stuff as a result of finding this than anything else that went on. And there was much excitement because there was much interest in, in determining the history of the people that built these mounds and earthworks. And so far as anyone knew prior to that, they had no history. Nothing was written down. There were no languages. This was an interesting find because it had a written language inscribed into it, and it was Hebrew. And many people at that time, including David Weirich, were trying to prove that these mounds and earthworks had been built by the lost tribes of Israel or, or other Hebrew groups. That got some attention. David was invited to Cincinnati by the reporter. There, he was, it was first denounced. Denounced by a Hebrew scholar as being too modern Hebrew. Denounced by a foremost a uh, sculptor, uh, Jones, who sculpted the bust of Lincoln, who said, ha, just adorn, anybody could make that. So David spent his only $19 and, on the trip and didn't get anything in recompense, came home, but he did strike up some friendships because he was encouraged, I think, by Dr. Unziker 
to go down to near Jackson Town and look at the, at the site that had once been the Great Stone Mound, where there were a number of mounds, one of which had been opened in 1850 by local farmers. They, when David got there, there was a, a wooden coffin. And I might put in here, I keep asking professional archaeologists to tell me where the American mound builders buried in coffins. And they never come up with one. But the coffin was still there, containing a skeleton with copper rings on it. It still was hair with, associated with the skull and, cl and cloth, which is rather interesting. David brought the coffin home, and it was lost to history. That was in early July. He went back again in November with another digging party, and they were digging, as David said in his letter, to see if it would hold water, the clay basin that was there. This was clay that was brought in. It was apparently clay brought in from the uh, strip mine, what we call the strip mine area, the coal mine areas of Ohio. It was there that he uncovered the stone box that contained the Decalogue stone. All right, so this is Interstate 70, which runs through the heart of what used to be the Great Stone Mound, which was the largest uh, mound in the Ohio Valley. Uh, it was about 55 feet tall, about 200 uh, feet in the base. It looked like a pyramid from, you know, far away. Um, they started, you know, taking down, you know, this mound piece by piece. It was made of boulders, you know, hard rock boulders, and they started taking it down in 1855. As you can see here, they found all these little mounds uh, inside of it. And in one of these individual mounds, I believe, oh, they show you right here, is where they found um, the Decalogue stone uh, inside. History of the American Indian by James Adair. Before I conclude this argument, I must here observe that when in Indians meet at night to gladden and unite their hearts before Johewa, they sing Johewa Sho, Johewa Sho, Johewa Shi, Johewa Shi, Johewa Shi. What does that sound like? Johashewa Shi, Johashewa Shi. Wow. Johashewa Shai with much energy. The first word is nearly in Hebrew characters. The name Joshua. All right, that's where I was going with it. That's what I was interpreting when I was, this is the first, you know, I'm just reading this as I record this with, you know, with you all. And it's, yeah, it's amazing, you know, all the stuff that we didn't know, all, you know, all these words that they were saying, these American Indians, that were really old Paleo Hebrew. Yo, hey, washi. All right, so again, it says the first word is nearly in Hebrew characters, the name of Joshua or Savior. Again, the name of Joshua, or Savior. Numbers 13a. That is properly expressed by our double vowel OO. Let it be observed that as is a ruler or commandant, so the Indians say, Bole hak se, strike a person that is criminal. In like manner, they sing, Meshi yo, Meshi yo, Meshi he, Meshi he, Meshi wa. Meshi wa, likewise, Meshi ha, yo, and Meshi wa ha, Meshi wa he, transposing ac accenting each syllable differently so as to make them appear different words. But they commonly make those words end with one syllable of the divine name, Johewa. If we connect this with the former part of the subject and consider they are commonly anointed all over in the time of their religious songs, and cir circuiting dances, the words seem to glance at the Hebrew original, and perhaps they are sometimes synonymous for signifies oil, the person anointed, or Meshiach, Meshiach, and he who anointed, he who is anointed, which is with the Indians, is Meshiha, yeah, Meshiha, Meshiach, Meshiha. And where do we get all this meshi, meshiko, meshikan, 
We're talking about Moses, Meshi, Moses, Moshek, Meshek. Who were the real Meshek's? What does Meshek really mean? Deliverer, right? Savior, as it says here. But who really brought the Israelites to Jerusalem? Who delivered them there? Joshua, right? Or <laughs> as the American natives call them, Yohewashi, 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 Joshua. We continue in the book, View of the Hebrews by Ethan Smith. And he says, the North American reviewers, in reviewing a sermon of Dr. Jarvis on this subject, delivered before the New York Historical Society, all right, in which he attempts to adduce much evidence to show that the natives of this continent are the tribes of Israel. Remark thus, the history and character of the Indian tribes of North America which have for some time been a subject of no inconsiderable curiosity and interest with the learned in Europe have not till lately attracted much notice among ourselves. But as the Indian nations are now fast vanishing and the individuals of them come less frequently under our observation, we also, as well as our European brethren, are beginning to take more lively interest than ever in the study of their character and history. In the course of their remarks, they add, to the testimonies here adduced by Dr. Jarvis, for example, that the Indians are the 10 tribes of Israel, might have been added several of our New England historians from the first settlement of the country. Some they proceed to mention and then add that the Reverend Mazers Samuel Sewell, fellow of Harvard College, and Samuel Willard, vice president of the same, were of opinion that the Indians are the descendants of Israel. Dr. Jarvis knows this as a hypothesis which has been a favorite topic with European writers and as a subject to which it is hoped the Americans may be said to be waking up at last. The Americans may be said to be waking up at last. Manasseh ben Israel, in a work entitled The Hope of Israel, all right, so famous writer, publisher, he had a publishing company in Amsterdam, I believe. Manasseh ben Israel, he heard the stories of a lot of uh, these Europeans that were coming back and all the evidence that they were showing him. So he printed a book, he, he, cre he wrote a book called The Hope of Israel. Has written to show that the American Indians are the 10 tribes of Israel. But as we have access to his authors, we may consult them for ourselves, all right? That's what we're doing, you know, we go straight to the source. The main pillar of his evidence is James Adair, Esquire. All right, we just read from James, right? Mr. Adair was a man of established character, as appears from good authority. He lived a trader among the Indians in the south of North America for 40 years. All right, again, we got this already, part three, but James Adair lived with your ancestors for 40 years. You think he didn't notice certain things? He left them and returned to England in 1774, and there published his History of the American Indians. Indians and his reasons for being persuaded that they are the ten tribes of Israel. Remarking on their descent and origin, he concludes thus, from the most accurate observations I could make in the long time I traded among the Indian Americans, I was forced to believe them linearly descended from Israelites. Had the nine tribes and a half of Israel that were carried off by Chalamanezer and settled in Medea continued their long, it is very probable by intermarrying with the natives and from their natural fickleness and promptness to idolatry and also from the force of example that they would have adopted and bowed before the gods of Media and Assyria and would have carried them along with them. But there is not a trace of this idolatry among the Indians. There's no trace of idolatry among your ancestors. You understand? You had one one creator, one great spirit. All right? Elijah Wana. Hawa. 
Mr. Adair gives his opinion that the ten tribes soon after their banishment from the land of Israel left Media and reached this continent from the northwest probably before the carrying away of the Jews to Babylon. All right? So they're always trying to figure out how you got here because they can phantom in their mind that this is the true old world in their time. They're still in hijack doctrine mode. All right? A summary will be given of the arguments of Mr. Adir and of a number of other, other writers on this subject. As the evidence given by Mr. Adir appears in some respect the most momentous and conclusive I shall adduce a testimonial in his behalf in the Star in the West, published by the Honorable Elias Budinot, LLD. Upon this subject, that venerable man says, the writer of these sheets has made a free use of Mr. Adair's history of the Indians, which renders it ne necessary that something further should be said of him. Something about the year 1774, Mr. Adair came to Elizabeth Town, where the writer lived, with his manuscript, and applied to Mr. Livingstone, afterward governor of New Jersey, a correct scholar, requesting him to correct his manuscript. He brought ample recommendations and gave a good account of himself. Our political troubles with Great Britain then increasing, it being the year before the commencement of the Revolutionary War, Mr. Adair, who was on his way to Great Britain, was advised not to risk being detained from his voyage till the work could be critically examined, but to set off as soon as possible. He accordingly took his passage in the first vessel bound to England. As soon as the war was over, Mr. Bodinot asked of himself, the writer sent to London to obtain a copy of this work. After reading it with care, he strictly examined a gentleman, then a member with him in Congress, and of excellent character, who had acted as our agent among the Indians to the southward during the war, relative to the points of fact stated by Mr. Adair, without letting him know the design, and from him found all the leading facts mentioned in Mr. Adair's history, fully confirmed from his own personal knowledge. He's saying they were testing people uh, and Mr. Adair to see if they would match the stories, people coming back from America, and they were matching what Mr. Adair was saying. All right, that's what they're telling you here. Here are the evidences of two great and good men most artlessly uniting in the leading facts stated by Mr. Adair, the character of Mr. Budinot, who was for some time president of the American Bible Society, is well known. He was satisfied with the truth of Mr. Adair's history and that the natives of our land are the Hebrews, the ten tribes, and he hence published his Star in the West on this subject, which is most worthy of the per perusal of all men. From various authors and travelers among the Indians, the fact that the American Indians are the ten tribes of Israel will be attempted to be proved by the following arguments. The American natives have one origin. Their language appears to have been Hebrew. Their language appears to have been Hebrew. They have had their imitation of the Ark of the Covenant in ancient Israel. They have been in the practice of circumcision. They have acknowledged one and only one God. The variety of traditions historical and religious go to evidence that they are the ten tribes of Israel. The celebrated William Penn gives accounts of the natives of Pennsylvania which go to corroborate the same point. And we got that, right? We got his actual letter and we got the history of Lancaster County stating what William Penn said about the Indians and the similarity he sees with them and the Hebrews he knows in England. They're having a tribe answering in various respects to the tribe of Levi sheds further light on this subject. Several prophetic traits of character given of the Hebrews do accord, accurately apply to the Aborigines of America. Again, this applies to the Aborigines of America, not Native Americans. That's why they're always like, we don't have no Hebrew history. That's what they tell me in their comments. They get all mad at me. 
they they're not overstanding this is only accurately applied to aborigines of america all right 10 the indians being in tribes with their heads and names of tribes affords further light upon this subject they're having an imitation of the ancient city of refuge evan says the truth of our subject other Indian rights and various other considerations go to evidence the fact that these people are the ten tribes of Israel. And that's when they uncovered the famous Decalogue stone, a black piece of slate. Actually, it's alabaster, but there's alabaster all over the world. Uh, very soft black sandstone with a priestly figure and characters on every single surface. A few of these letters look like standard Hebrew, but most of them don't. But uh, working from the clue that a few of them look like standard Hebrew, uh, John McCarty, again, the uh, Episcopalian uh, minister in uh, Newark, was able to decipher the rest of the letters and um, discover that the, the text here is basically the, an abridged version of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, uh, written in Hebrew language, but in this funny alphabet. And over the head of this uh, robed and bearded figure is, uh, is the name uh, Moshe, or Moses, in, in Hebrew. So presumably this is Moses uh, uh, giving the Ten Commandments. Well, the um, alphabet that's used on a Decalogue stone is actually one of its most interesting um, peculiarities. Uh, now this uh, chart shows, compares the standard Hebrew alphabet to the alphabet that appears on the Decalogue stone. Uh, this column here is the or basically standard Hebrew letters, and these are the Decalogue letters. And about half the letters here are basically standard Hebrew. You can see the Bet is basically the same, the Dalit is basically the same, the He is basically the same, and so forth. But um, perhaps half of the letters are um, uh, very unusual, in fact, uh, essentially unknown as, as Hebrew. Personally, I'm, um, I wouldn't be interested in these things if I didn't think they were, had a very good chance of being authentic. Uh, I'm not a Hebrew scholar myself, but I've, uh, these things have gotten me interested enough that I've learned a little bit about the Hebrew alphabet and something about the history of the Hebrew alphabet. Frankly, I think that Newark, Ohio, at one time, was sort of a Mecca or Jerusalem kind of place, a place to which one would come for great religious events, a place to which one would bring the remains of the famous people, just as we will take people to Rome to bury them in St. Peter's Basilica. I think people were brought here, and that these are perhaps mementos or talismans or something associated with famous people. History of the American Indians by James Adair. He says that these red savages formerly understood the radical meaning and emblematical design of the important words they use in their religious dances and sacred hymns is pretty obvious. If we consider the reverence they pay to the mysterious divine name Yahweh, in pausing during a long breath on each of the two first syllables. So he's saying, Yahweh. They're defining good by joining Wa to the end of a word, which otherwise expresses moral evil as before noticed, and again by making the same word a negative of good by separating the first syllable of that divine name into two syllables and adding you as a superlative termination you, all their sacred songs seem likewise to illustrate it very clearly. Hallelujah, Shilu Wa, Meshi Wa, Meshi Ha Yo. The words which they repeat in their divine hymns while dancing in three circles around their supposed holy fire a deem so sacred that they have not been known ever to mention them at any other time and as they are a most erect people their bowing posture during the time of those religious acclamations and evocations help to confirm their hebrew origin all right helps to confirm their hebrew origin <laughs>